Hello there. Welcome. I'm Esther Awuni. It's the 25th of May. And in, just in case you're an African, you're wondering why all the buzz? Well, yes, it's Africa Day, a day Africans have earned over the years to mark the founding of the Organization of African Unity, now called the African Union. Today, we celebrate African solidarity, diversity and creativity. The theme of this year is art, culture and heritage, the levers of building the Africa that we want. This year, however, we are celebrating in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has pushed the continent into its worst recession in 25 years. But is there light at the end of the tunnel? Well, the African continental free trade area is an initiative many believe can help African economies recover from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. But there are many questions still unanswered about how this is going to play out. Well, let's get some questions from across the continent, starting from South Africa. Hi, I'm Pearl Tusi, actress, mother, and businesswoman. Happy Africa Day, everyone. Now, lately we have seen a new shift in the mindset of young Africans. More and more, we're embarking on an entrepreneurial path to create multi-stream incomes. I myself have embarked on a new business venture with the Satota Collection, creating soaps, candles and diffusers known as Black Rose by Pearl Tusi. I also collaborate with Afrobotanics and we create Black Pearl Hair by Pearl Tusi. So we hear that the AFC FTA is a game changer. I would like to understand how this is the case. How can I take my business to Africa with the different rules that exist in the different African markets? And from Nigeria. Hello Africa, happy Africa day. My name is Ladi Pope. I'd like to find out how the everyday man and woman benefits from the continental agreement. What is it we should know about it? Now to answer these questions and more, my guest is Dr. Abdul Mukhtar. He is the African Development Bank's Director of the Industrial and Trade Development Department. Dr. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us today. Now for our conversation for the next 13 minutes, we're going to be talking about how African solidarity can help uh, the continent overcome the economic challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. We're also going to highlight some of the innovations that we've seen among uh, Africa's uh, young uh, innovators. We'll also examine the prospects of the Africa continental featured area in building Africa back better. And also some of those ch lingering challenges uh, and gaps that we we still need to you know, tweak and take care of uh, to ensure that uh, uh, we, Africa's recovery is sustainable. But I'd like you to start by answering some, two questions. I'm sure you heard those two questions. Uh, one was from uh, Pearl Tusi, South African uh, businesswoman and uh, actress. And she was asking, how can she take her business uh, to Africa with the different rules that exist in the different African markets? Thank you, Esther. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, address this. I didn't hear the question specifically, but I guess the question is, uh, what does the AFCFTA mean for the African economy, for entrepreneurs like the uh, person who asked that question? I think that um, to, to put that in proper context, one needs to look at the structure of the African economy as it is now, uh, pre-AFCFTA, for example. Uh, as we know, Africa is uh, hugely fragmented. There is a uh, huge geographic uh, fragmentation. Uh, logistically, Africa is fragmented, uh, about 16 trade zones on the continent. Uh, people need visas to go to 80% of uh, countries. Uh, a lot of trade barriers. Um, Intra-Africa trade is the lowest uh, anywhere on the, in the world. It's about 14 to 18%. Uh, compared to maybe about uh, almost 70 percent in Europe, for example, and over 54 percent in North America. So that is a huge. That is really one of the big, big, big issues that the CFTA is trying to to address. Second, you know, if you look at the production uh, structures on on the continent, they are quite weak. You know, supply chains are constrained. Uh, the economies are mostly undiversified. Uh, they are mostly small, and most of the countries are poor. You know, if you look at even from a landlocked uh, perspective, you know, 44 countries in the world are landlocked. 16 of those are in Africa. Uh, in terms of production, in terms of industrial base, uh, Africa only accounts for 1.5 percent of the world's total manufacturing output, compared to say uh, almost 22 percent in uh, the Asia Pacific. 
So what the FCA, of course, is supposed to do for um, entrepreneurs, for people with businesses, is, is to create a big market, you know, um, so the, the idea is really that there is power in numbers, uh, bringing together a content of 1.3 billion people, uh, 2.5 trillion G dollars of GDP, that will make Africa the eighth largest economy in the world. Uh, 54 com 55 countries, you know, and this is like the single largest uh, free trade area since the establishment of the World Trade Organization in 1994. So really, I think that the the, the value, what, what will happen, how things are going to change is in addition to creating this huge opportunity in terms of market access, in terms of market consolidation uh, for entrepreneurs, for people who are producing goods and who are producing services, but it also promotes industrialization. Uh, you know, you create now a situation whereby uh, people, business owners, SME owners, will find ways to move up value chains uh, to diversify their economies, to build supply chains across multiple countries, uh, but also for countries to look at areas where they have comparative advantage so that they can um, uh, excel more, they can provide and produce better goods, uh, more qualitative goods, because now you have the markets that will be uh, produced. And this overall will result in huge development of the SME sector across okay. the continent. And I think that uh, this is where we're headed. Now, I'd like us to quickly take the second question. I know you've, 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 you actually did give a very uh, extensive uh, response to the first question. The second question is similar, but a little different. Now, this is coming from Nigerian musician Ladekwan. He says, that how does the African continental featured area benefit the ordinary African man and woman? What do they need to know? Okay, so this is an excellent question because, to be honest, you know, um, there is uh, there is something for everybody on this in the CFTA uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Agenda. You know, there is something for governments, there is something for private sector, there is something for the corporates. Uh, so, for talking about uh, ordinary people, citizens, what they need to know is basically this is a win-win scenario. Is there is something for everybody? If you're a big corporate. Uh, you'll be able to, uh, you know, you have a big market uh, that you can sell your products and you can, you know, upscale your production. Uh, if you're a small business uh, owner trying to just build a small business, you know, you absolutely can link up to some of these big value chains in different countries instead of just, you know, focusing uh, within your own country as it has been in, in the past. Um, if you are a small farmer in uh, rural Ghana or Rwanda or wherever, uh, Nigeria in a rural area, area in Nigeria, you just, you know, have a small farm, you know, you look at it in terms of whatever you do, there will be a link to a bigger market. So whatever you produce uh, within your locality, you know, you'll be able to uh, plug into something bigger within your country, but more importantly, from within your country across into many other countries, uh, it will give you an opportunity to produce higher quality products and goods uh, and services. But more importantly, as countries try to take advantage of the CFTA, you know, there will be policies and initiatives and regulations that will be put in place by governments uh, just to make the business environment uh, more interesting and, and more uh, okay. attractive to the ordinary citizens. So there is a huge benefit for ordinary citizens in the CFTA implementation. Now, as you know, we are celebrating uh, this year's Africa Day in the, you know, in the midst of uh, a pandemic. But despite that, uh, we, we're hearing stories of you know, solidarity and unity across the African continent. But when you look across uh, Africa, what are those stories that, that stick out for you, those stories of, uh, that you've seen of solidarity and unity uh, on the ground? Yeah, so um, you see uh, what the COVID pandemic has done for us is really just to expose some weaknesses. And I think that, uh, um, they, you know, it's often said that, uh, you know, when you see a problem, you look at it as, uh, not only just as a challenge, but also an opportunity. And I think that Africans really um, have done exactly that. You know, they have actually turned the problem of uh, the pandemic into huge opportunities. You know, you see uh, people really pivoting into things that ordinarily would not have thought before. You know, we saw how uh, supply chains have been disrupted in the past um, uh, due to the pandemic, you know, even basic, you know, uh, 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 personal protective equipment, PPEs were not in, in good supply. So we see a lot of like innovation and really 
just the the idea that the the, the creativity you know of africans but also just coming together uh, within countries across countries and saying look you know we need to take care of each other um countries have looked out for each other you know across the borders uh, where you know you have products or some food services or some food products that are in some countries that are not in other countries we see a lot of movement you know across those borders you know to other countries to help everybody just get out of the uh, economic impact of the of the pandemic uh, but more importantly really you just see that whole alignment between the government the private sector you know ngos uh, just coming together and say look you know we have to fight this whether it's uh, in in directly related to the pandemic in terms of you know how do we test more people how do we uh, make sure that if people get vaccinated but also how do we make sure that basic you know um, sustainable some things like food uh, again like i talk about the, the basic equipment ppes and so on that just available everywhere and just integrate in supply chains and we see a lot of innovation and creativity from young people especially you know just like you know coming up with with, with really bright ideas you know we see how for example you know the issue of masks uh, that you know we were reliant on imports from a few other from few foreign countries but you know suddenly you know you have you know the fashion industry you know tailors uh, artisans coming together and designing things uh, and saying like we can do this for ourselves and you see this just really catching up across countries so a huge solidarity uh, a huge um, um, uh, incentive to look out for each other and i really think that we've done well and i think that we can even do more uh, going forward now, uh, with all that innovation that we've seen, how does that uh, build into, uh, fit into uh, those pillars of recovery that every uh, African country uh, is trying to, you know, tap into to build, uh, to get a more sustainable recovery? I see that these young African innovators are sort of shaping the next, you know, Africa that we're going to see, and that's going to involve a lot of, uh, intelli will involve a lot of technology and, of course, uh, innovation. How do you see this potentially reshaping the African continent? So um, young people, you talk about like young innovators and so on, like uh, let's put the youth uh, issue in Africa in perspective because it's really, really important to, to understand. You know, as we know, 60% of African population is less than 25 years. So Africa has a young, it's the youngest continent. Uh, by 2050, it's expected that we'll have at least 460 million youth. Uh, this is six times the number of youth in, in Europe, for example. Uh, by 2030, you know, we'll have an average of 30 million youth getting into the labor market each year. So it's a huge... Uh, challenge uh, for Africa, just the number of youth that are going into the market and that uh, currently exist, but also it provides its most significant opportunity. Like you pointed out, you know, there are many ways, uh, especially when you look at, you know, post-COVID, um, you know, some of the uh, areas, so in the, just talking, coming back to the FCFTA, for example, um, you know, there are many things within the design of the CFTA that is meant to really specifically address, you know, youth-related issues and, and concerns. As we know, in addition to all the barriers that we see in trade and, and development overall, uh, young people uh, uh, particularly, you know, have even more uh, problems and challenges when it comes to trade. You know, they have uh, lack of access to information, trade information, for example. Um, they don't have as much assets and, and financial uh, ability and, and capabilities. The power dynamics in terms of business networking is not as available to them as it is for, for everybody else. Uh, but also, you know, the many of the non-tariff barriers that you see across countries, you know, that affect trading, uh, where the young people are particularly um, active okay. in, in trade. Now, uh, in terms of, you know, talking about, about where to focus, you know, digital economy is clearly one area, you know, because uh, it's innovation is, uh, that's, you know, the youth in African youth are very innovative, you know, so digital economy, fintech, uh, ICT, e-commerce, you know, these are huge opportunities for them. Uh, but also just the ease of movement that will come with the CFTA, for example, as things open up, obviously. Uh, uh, Dr. Abu, if I could just, just squeeze in one uh, last question, if you don't mind. Now, uh, uh, back to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we found Africa at the bottom of the priority list when it came to vaccine access and equity. What steps do we need to take now as we continue to build that Africa that we want to ensure that we can respond better, perhaps on our own also, to any future pandemics? Uh, excellent question. You know, look, we have to take the bull by the horns. Um, this is an, an opportunity. COVID-19 is an eye-opener for Africa, a situation whereby we import 99% of the vaccines that we use on the continent is clearly unsustainable, it's not acceptable, uh, and things have to change. 
many things are going on. There are a lot of discussions at the political level. You know, a few weeks ago, about a month ago, we had this high level global uh, vaccine manufacturing conference uh, organized by the CDC and the African Development Bank and other partners. You know, they, they are trying to really look at the exact same question. Um, we are developing in the African Development Bank uh, a pharmaceutical sector development strategy, which is really to say, what do we do so that in five years, in 10 years, Africa will be self sufficient at least in basic pharmaceutical supplies, but more importantly, in vaccines. So a lot of things have to happen. Of course, there are regulatory issues, there are financial issues, there are policy issues, but all those have been addressed and have been discussed at the highest level. And the African Development Bank is really at the forefront of okay. really making this happen, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdul. But of course, uh, stick around before we let you go. Let's see, uh, we just want to quickly see what other uh, uh, African entrepreneurs uh, have been uh, up to. Now, COVID Action and UK Aid partnered with the One Campaign to find some innovative entrepreneurs that are making a difference. We start from Nigeria with Victor Boyle Komolafe, uh, who is a co-founder of Giver, which stands for Garbage In, Value Out. Take a look. Hello, my name is Victor Bo Komalafe from Nigeria, and I am the co-founder of Jivo, Garbage In, Value Out. At Jivo, we're trying to solve two problems. The first problem is the waste generation issue in Africa, in Nigeria in this case, and the problem of low manufacturing in Nigeria, which leads to the lack of access to essential goods for members of the public. This was a big problem during the COVID pandemic. And we saw that across the world. How we have solved this problem is by using the locally generated, locally aggregated materials, recyclables in this case, from the communities to produce life-saving PPE, such as face shields and face masks. In the last year, we have made over 15,000 units of these products and we've given 10% of them free of charge to vulnerable members of the community and to essential workers to help the, prevent the spread of COVID in our communities. Thank you very much. Wow, that is amazing. Well, let's move on to South Sudan. Yeni Yenki Nika, co-founder of Go Girls ICT Initiative, also shares her story. Yes, uh, hello, my name is Sine Yenki Nika. I'm from South Sudan. Uh, I'm the co-founder and mentorship director at Google's ICT Initiative and at the same time the team leader for Go Sanitize. South Sudan mainly depends on imports from its neighboring countries and as it joined the rest of the world in the fight against the pandemic, the demand for hand sanitizers and rubbing alcohol went high and the prices in the in the local market shoot high that a common South Sudanese person couldn't afford to even get for themselves a hand sanitizer or a rubbing alcohol. So Go Girls has been working together with primary and secondary school teachers, especially science teachers, uh, to create what we call the Open Science Framework for classroom experimentation. And the whole aim or the objective of the framework is how can we promote science using locally avail available reagents in the market rather than the expensive imported reagents which most schools in South Sudan cannot afford? Together with the five chemistry teachers from the secondary school and 10 local brewers within Juba, we exchange knowledge and ideas on the production of high quality and affordable hand sanitizers from locally available resources within South Sudan. And hence, this led to the birth of Co-Sanitize, a social enterprise poised to raise great heights in the production of alcohol-based products, such as hand sanitizers of high quality and affordable prices by the communities within South Sudan. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Abdul, we just listened to two uh, stories from two entrepreneurs yet again showing that entrepreneurial spirit, not just entrepreneurial spirit, but also that innovation, solving common economic problems uh, on the continent. We talk often about how we want to have uh, African solutions to African problems. Now, as what, how do we sustain this momentum? How do we show some more support? I know that the AFCFTA would uh, also help uh, some of these, many of these businesses scale, but how do we ensure that we get more of these entrepreneurs to come and how do we support them more? Uh, very important question and we need to and we have to. You know, um, it's important to look at some of the barriers and the challenges that these entrepreneurs face and try to address them. 
You know, one of them, uh, of course, the CFTA is supposed to address issues around market access, but there is also the issue around uh, financing. Uh, so it's important to really identify, you know, various channels and, and sources for finance to, to help these entrepreneurs. Um, organizations like the Africa Development Bank, of course, you know, we're big on supporting entrepreneurship through uh, lines of credit that we give to financial institutions, but we also have a lot of entrepreneur programs. Uh, we are in the process of establishing, uh, our president has announced what we call the youth uh, empowerment, uh, youth entrepreneurship investment banks that we're supporting, you know, youth uh, entrepreneurs. So financing is another one. And the second is really uh, to look at some of the, uh, another barrier that they face is really issues around infrastructure, you know, whether it's connectivity infrastructure for many of the digital businesses, uh, it's important to walk through this, whether at uh, public policy level or the private sector or through PPPs, uh, to put together that uh, infrastructure. The, the other one is, uh, of course, the, the skills, uh, try to develop skills and, and human capital, uh, because that's one barrier that often when you talk to entrepreneurs, they say, you know, they don't have the necessary skills. They want to upscale, they want to uh, grow bigger, uh, but they cannot have the right skills. So, um, you know, tying all of these things to issues around education, uh, around skills development, around, uh, you know, just, you know, helping vocational training and so on uh, will obviously help. And then finally, I think that uh, the policies have to be in place. You know, uh, to be honest, you know, what we need to do uh, on this continent, you know, on as, as any time I move around the continent in, in my job as African Development Bank, I see the huge opportunity. And these two entrepreneurs, you know, there are multiples, hundreds of them and thousands of them across the continent. They just need to have the right policies. So governments need to put the right policies to make the business environment easy, uh, to be able to register companies, to be able to operate you know, reduce regulations, you know, provide logistic support so that they can move their goods and products, products and services across the different parts of the continent. And when this uh, happen, when this happen um, and, and every, all hands must be on deck to make this happen, I think that the entrepreneurial spirit will be unleashed and Africa will be really, really uh, on a growth trajectory. Well, speaking, uh, just some final thoughts from you. Many entrepreneurs, many Afri especially Africa's young population, ask uh, and wonder what the Africa of the future, what their Africa uh, would look like. I know the AFDB has a number of initiatives to help drive uh, development on the continent around agriculture, the industrialized Africa, etc. But what are your hopes? What, are, what is the vision of the Africa that you want to see or you hope to see ten, five, ten, 10 years, 15 years from now? Um, you know, 10, 15 years from now, I really see an Africa that is leading the world uh, in all aspects of, of uh, 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 human endeavor, in all the things that matter. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, you look at it now, when you look at the energy gap that we have, the infrastructure gap, you know, uh, over $100 billion per annum spending that is required uh, for the next 10 years, every year for the next 10 years to, 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 to do this. I want an Africa where there would be no infrastructure gap. Uh, I want to see an Africa that has adequate human and capital um, uh, development indices, you know, in terms of healthcare, in terms of education at par with everybody. Uh, I want to see an Africa that is fully industrialized, uh, not only talking about industries of the past, but also industries of the future, uh, talking about the first industrial revolution, for example, you know, taking full advantage of that. Uh, I want to see an Africa that is fully integrated uh, across, you know, countries, you know, unified, bigger markets uh, with a lot of supply chains. And I want to see Africa that is really self-reliant uh, and independent. I mean, you cannot really be independent. You know, the world, uh, of course, is a, is a global uh, village and everybody is interconnected, but an Africa that is able to feed itself uh, without necessarily uh, importing food from, from, from elsewhere. I want to see an Africa that is able to produce uh, the basic uh, drugs that it needs. Uh, so talking about pharmaceuticals, I want to see an Africa that is really ready uh, to uh, take care of the next pandemic and come out stronger. Uh, and, and, and more resilient uh, Doc, than ever before. Dr. Mukta, I, I must thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for joining us on this Africa Day special. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you, Asa. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Bye. Abdul Mukta, the African Development Bank's Director of the Industrial and Trade Development Department. Well, thank you also so much for joining us on this Africa Day special. As we wrap up, I'll leave you with some favorite African quotes. Well, if you want to walk fast, then walk along. If you want to go far, then walk together Without dignity, there is no liberty. Without justice, there is no dignity. And without independence, there are no freedom. Nelson Mandela said, Freedom is the right to be free. The right to be free is not merely the right to be free. Nelson Mandela said, For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. 
The one thing I have never been afraid of is standing in front of important people and speaking my mind. I represent the men who may never go to the UN or meet a president. I am never afraid of speaking truth to power by Lima Boy. A day will come when history will speak, but it will not be the history which will be taught in Brussels, Paris, Washington or United Nations. Africa will write its own history and in both North and South it will be a history of glory and dignity. The people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. That's a quote by Marcus Garvey, the Jamaican activist. It is clear that we must find an African solution to our problems and that this can only be found in African unity. Divided, we are weak, but united, Africa could become one of the greatest forces of good in the world. In the words of Kwame Nkrumah, I am an African. Because one finger cannot wash the whole face, only a whole hand to wash the whole face. Therefore, African countries must work together with the ICT agreement to achieve Vision 2016. I'm African, I'm Brian. I am an African. God so created us equally with purpose and different gifts. I am an African. I am an African. My name is Mary Lomoji and I am a one champion for Kenya. I am African. Happy African Day. Happy African Day.